This is Dennis Sarususem on the next series of Success Talks, and I'm really happy to have Baroness Scotland here with me, so thank you for doing this. My yeah. pleasure. Um, firstly, um, did you care to give us a bit more about your background and the, how that's led to where you are and what kind of initiatives you're involved in? Um, well, I, am, I was born in the Dominica in the Caribbean and I basically grew up in the East End of London in Walthamstow and I became a lawyer at 21, a silk at 35 and I subsequently became the first woman in 700 years to be appointed as Her Majesty's Attorney General for England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And so, how how did how exactly did you get there? As in, like, what steps did you take? Um, well, basically, I always wanted to be someone who'd help other people. And I was trying to think about the nature of the skills I had and what I'd be best at. What I thought I'd be best at is explaining things that other people sometimes couldn't articulate themselves, and being able to be the conduit for those sorts of conversations. So. I decided that looking at all the different professions, law actually did that. So I was 21 when I qualified and I basically wasn't sure what sort of lawyer I wanted to be, whether I wanted to be um, a, a barrister or a solicitor when I was 20, when I finished my degree, but I sort of worked out that I didn't want to become a solicitor. So if I didn't want to become a solicitor, the only thing left was being a barrister. And I wasn't sure whether I'd be a good barrister or not a good barrister, but I really wanted to give it a try, because I was brought up to believe that there was no disgrace in failing. The only disgrace is in not having tried. Okay. And you're involved in a load of initiatives now. Um, mm -hmm. Do you care to share what initiatives you're in and like what skills you had that, through your career that helped you lead into these? Okay, well, I've, um, I am one of my parents' uh, 12 only children uh, because I'm their 10th child and they used to say they only had one of each of us. So I was brought up in a very loving, kind family and I thought that that loving, kind environment was what every child had and until I started to realise that's not the experience of every child. My parents helped me to understand that God had given absolutely every one of us a skill. And it was our job to find that skill, to hone it, and then use it for the benefit of other people. And it was quite astonishing to me that other people didn't always see the wonderful talents they had. And it, so many of us believe that if we can do something, it can't be worth anything. Because, you know, if I can do it, it must be just so easy for everybody else. Um, and it's understanding that's not so. So I was, I was brought up in this very enabling, loving, caring, big, noisy Caribbean family. Uh, and I knew that the only reason I had achieved any of the things I'd achieved, because I had them right behind me, supporting me, encouraging me, telling me I could do anything. And then I realised how lucky I was. And then I looked at lots of other people who were equally talented, equally gifted, equally able to do great things. Some of them weren't achieving those things that they could achieve because they didn't have any self-confidence. They'd been told they were useless and that they couldn't do anything. And I really saw every time I watched that happen, there but for the grace of God, go on, I could have been that person if I hadn't been lucky enough to be born into the family I was born into. So that um, shock of understanding that not everyone's life was like mine, and we were by no means wealthy, mm -hmm. but people can't really put a price on love, and I was extraordinarily well loved. And so when I discovered that not all women are treated with respect, with the generosity and the kindness that I was treated, that was also really very shocking for me. Uh, I have seven brothers and a father that I really love. So I thought men were supposed to be kind and generous and funny and good looking and poetic and great. And so to understand that not all men were like that and that wasn't the experience that all women had, 
also was very shocking at 21. And I started to see domestic violence cases in court and listen to uh, stories from women and their children and understand the pain and trauma they go through and how hard it was for some of those individuals even to keep breathing. Mm -hmm. Because many, you know, we've got one in four um, women in our country uh, affected by domestic violence, one in six men and between 750,000 and 950,000 children every year live in those homes. And when I looked at how those children were thriving, many of them weren't doing well. You know, they are overrepresented in the figures of children who don't meet their developmental needs, and their the developmental um, uh, standards. They, they fail when it comes to meeting their educational uh, attainment. They do less well in um, other areas, quite often there are issues that are overrepresented in the mental health vision, overrepresented in the criminal justice figures. So in any indices you like, um, they are doing less well. I know that when you were at school, there was a teacher that said you shouldn't become a lawyer. Um, if you had the opportunity to bump into that individual again, um, what would you say to them? I'd, I'd say to them that um, they should be braver about the aspirations they set for children because the irony was that that teacher thought she was protecting me from unrealistic expectations. Here I was, a young black child, the tenth of twelve children, living in Walthamstow with no contacts in the world of law. Um, I wasn't going to go to Oxbridge, I didn't have a wealthy family, I was a socialist, so not Tory, um, I was a committed Christian, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I, I wasn't a butch girl, right? so I wasn't going to be uh, the stereotype that they had then. So she clearly thought that I was slightly crazy to think that I could become a lawyer. There weren't any black female lawyers. So I actually think that she thought she was saving me from myself and that I shouldn't be allowed to continue with these inflated aspirations because I was going to be bitterly disappointed. And people my whole life have been trying to save me from my unrealistic aspirations. And so what I'd say to her is don't constrain children's dreams. Help them to create them. Help them to fulfill them. So instead of looking at a child like me and saying you can't, it would have been so wonderful if she had been able to say, yes, you can, and I am going to assist you to get there. And that's why I will always feel so powerfully grateful to my family, because it was my family who constantly said, yes you can, and yes you must, and it was non-negotiable for them that I would achieve things. And so I really bless them, because they gave me the aspiration to aim high. And I think one of the reasons why many children don't do well is people have no aspirations for them. They're always telling them, you can't do this, you're worthless, you can't achieve. And it's not true. My father used to say, reach for the moon, you might catch a star. And if there is, as I said earlier, no disgrace in failing, you might as well try. Exactly. Uh, and I think one of the sad things is so often people are so scared of failing, people say, what will I look like? They never try. And I believe that every time someone told me I can't do something, that I would listen to that if they were telling me I couldn't do it for some valid reason, that I didn't have the skill, you know, I, I, I needed to um, go in a hole which was two foot high and I'm five foot eight so I won't fit. Okay, well that's a concrete reason that I listen to. But I was being told I couldn't do things because I was black and I was female. 
So as far as I was concerned, those are the two things I couldn't and would never want to change. So it wasn't a valid um, barrier and I was very happy to try. And if I didn't try, well at least I knew I'd give them a go. What are the keys to success and what's been the key to your success? Uh, for me, the key to my success has been my faith. Because there have been very difficult, hard times. And I don't know how I would have been able to deal with those hard times without my fundamental belief that God was walking through this with me. And that if it was his will, I would achieve. And also accepting that when things go wrong, they're going wrong for a purpose. And that I might not understand that at that time, but it would become clearer in time. And, there's some, and every single person has those dark moments. Um, and I think the most important thing is to say, don't give up. Nobody, nobody who achieves anything does so without hard work, sacrifice, commitment. Um, and it doesn't happen any other way. And quite often people look at where someone ends up, but they don't look at all the hard work, the suffering, the late nights that they had to use in order to get there. And it's great, isn't it? Everyone wants what someone else has, but when you ask them the question, would you be prepared to do what they did in order to get where they are? Then I'm going, oh, oh, I'm really sorry, not me. So I think. My mother used to say, before you envy what someone else has, you have to be ready to walk in their shoes, mm -hmm. do what they've done, make the sacrifices and commitments they have. And if you're willing to do all that, okay, knock yourself out. But, um, but I think it's, it's just my deep belief that um, all of us have something special about us, every single person and that we have something special to give, which, is, which only we can give. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd love to say to people, no one can do you better than you. I can't be you. you know, if, I, if my task was to be you, I'd fail. Yeah. I, I can't be male, I can't be young, I can't be, I can't be you. So, so all of us must just be content with being ourselves and being comfortable that being ourselves is what we're supposed to be. So in 30 or 40 years time, you're looking back over your life and your career, what would you want your legacy to be? I think I'd want um, my legacy to be that I tried, that in every single role that I had, I actually tried as hard as I could to work as much as I could to make sure that this world was a tiny, tiny bit better for me having lived in it than me not having done so. And or if my legacy can't deliver that, then I would like it to be said that I did our world no harm. Baron of Scotland, thank you very much for your time. And that's another series complete for Success Talks. Thank you very much. Thank you.